Uh, I am thrilled to be here with two of my favorite human beings, Matt and Padma. So, so many of us uh, recognize the value of effective leadership teams towards driving company success. Daria and Carl and Rob talked about it. It's something that more and more companies are kind of taking for granted, but it's equally important to appreciate the power that boards uh, can have in the ultimate outcome of a business, right? In many cases, we've all read the stories, the relationship between a founder and a board can be the difference maker between a company's, uh, can be the difference maker for a company's trajectory and overall story and outcome. At M13, we sit on over 15 boards across our portfolio. We're always trying to be the most value added board member and investor we can be. And so I'm especially thrilled to have these two experts joining us today. I will give you their quick bios and then we'll hear from them because they have so much interesting things to say in our session. So Padma Warrior is the founder and CEO of Fable. Fable's mission is to be the world's best mobile service for curated reading where people can share in private groups and creators can self-publish. Padma is the former CTO of Cisco and Motorola. She's a current board member of Microsoft and Spotify, former board member of Box and the Gap. So incredibly relevant experience uh, to bear on the discussion today. And Matt, who's a founder and CEO of Bolster. Bolster is an on-demand executive talent marketplace connecting companies with experienced vetted executives or interim fractional advisory project base or board roles. He's a former CEO and founder of Return Path, where I was lucky to work with and learn most of what I know from him. He is the author of Startup CEO, Startup CXO, and coming out this fall, Startup Boards. He's a founder and board chair of Path Forward, and he served on over a dozen corporate and nonprofit and community boards. So couldn't be more thrilled to have this incredible panel with us, and we'll get right to it from there. So Padma, I'd love to start with you, your experience, both on both sides of the table. In your experience, what makes a good board member? What are the characteristics of the type of person that makes an effective board member from what you've seen and experienced? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matt, and uh, great to meet you, uh, uh, my fellow panelists, and uh, look forward to your in, 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 uh, insights as well. I, you know, I think from my experience, uh, people often confuse a good operator, uh, what it means to be a good operator and what it means to be a good board member. Um, I think being a good operator is uh, necessary to be, uh, in my opinion, uh, be an effective board member, but the roles are very, very different. As a good board member, your responsibility is uh, to coach the leadership team, the management team, to challenge them and, and to really uh, help them think about uh, things that perhaps they don't think of every day, bringing your experience to the forefront, right? You know, so primarily your role as a board member is A, understand the business deeply um, and then help them think about things that are not perhaps in their linear way of uh, thinking about the business. So you bring in that outside in perspective and, and occasionally challenge them in their thinking and encourage them to think beyond what perhaps, you know, when you're running a company as an operator, you're sort of like in the business every single day. As a board member, you're there um, frequently, but not every single day. So you, you have the advantage of bringing in the outside in perspective. Uh, oftentimes the mistake I see rookie board members, including by myself, by the way, when I first joined the board, I made this mistake. Um, you think you're there to run the company and you're not. Uh, you know, that is a big, big distinct, distinction. Um, it is especially hard if you're currently in an operating role like I am, because my day job is to build Fable, run Fable, and previously Neo, and before that at Cisco. But when I'm at the Microsoft board meeting, I'm not running Microsoft. I'm, I'm not running Spotify. That leadership team is, is doing it. You're not there necessarily to solve problems. You're just there to see if they're, if they're taking the right approach to solve the problems. Um, and then, of course, there's fiduciary responsibilities like compliance, making sure things are being done um, with integrity, uh, the values of the company and the, your values are not in conflict. I think these are some things that are uh, um, very critical. And um, uh, I would say really differentiate the role between you being a good operator and you being a good board member. That's that's fantastic. And Matt, we know that leadership is not just an individual exercise, but it's a team exercise. So when you think about good boards as a team, as a unit, what are the characteristics of an effective board as a whole from your experience? Yeah, well, first, Matt, uh, it's good to see you. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, Padma, it's nice to meet you and honored to be on a panel with you. Um, 
I, I, I was just taking notes while you were speaking. I think you just said five or six phenomenal things in, in your first couple of minutes. Um, but you know, it's interesting, CEOs um, frequently think about their leadership team as their team. And the reality is when you're a CEO, you have two teams. You have your leadership team and your board. And uh, I always encourage um, CEOs that I mentor or any of our clients to really think about their board as a team and think about developing it the same way you think about developing your leadership team. Um, so that speaks to how you construct it, who's on it, and then how you manage it and lead it as the leader of your board. And even if you're not technically the chairman, right, you are kind of the leader of the board um, when you're a founder and CEO because you're the leader of the overall organization. Um, so, you know, to, to build an effective team, um, you have to uh, treat it like a team. You have to think about who you're putting on it, make sure you have people with complementary backgrounds, um, diverse experiences, diverse skill sets. Um, and, uh, you know, almost think about it, um, you know, you think about it like a, like a puzzle, like a jigsaw puzzle, like what's the piece that's missing anytime you think about expanding the board or adding a director. But as a CEO, um, you know, in terms of turning your board into an effective team, if you think about the kinds of things you would do with your leadership team to make them effective, um, you are probably doing things like offsites once in a while. You're probably having some social time. Um, and COVID has definitely scrambled everything up for people, but there are still ways to have social time uh, with teams. And, and you should be doing all of those things with your board as well, even though it's going to be smaller amounts of time because you're talking about senior executives that are busy and, and are not full-time working with you. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I never have a board meeting that doesn't have at least a little bit of social time attached to it, even if it's, hey, the board gets on Zoom 30 minutes before everybody else joins. And we just talk about what's going on in our lives or we synchronize it so everyone gets a DoorDash delivered to their house at the same time. Um, or, you know, uh, we make someone, we make everyone um, pull out their phones and show a picture to everybody else that they've taken in the last month and talk about something going on in their life. Um, you have to uh, sort of cultivate that teamness um, with, with your board uh, and get them working together well as a team uh, so that they can best serve you and the business and your leadership team. That's great. And I'd love to, we'll go back to you, Padmo. I'd love your perspective on this, Matt, because I know you've done some thoughtful work around it. When you think about a, a founder needing a board, obviously there's investor components, but there's also independent components. So when you think about why a founder even would want a board and why they would want a board beyond the investor requirements and when it's time to bring in an independent member, I'd love kind of your perspective, Padma, having done this first. When, when should a founder think about building out a team with an independent members? Are some of the things they think about different early, late stage? pre-IPO versus the public company. What are some things that the founders in our portfolio should be thinking about as it comes to kind of building out this independent team? Yeah, I mean, I would say every company is uh, different, right? If you set aside the regulations, which when you're thinking of going public, a public company is required to have certain ingredients in the board. Um, and so you have to meet that. You need an audit committee and you know there needs to be independence in, in the board. Um, so if you're, if you're late stage and getting ready to go public, you know, of course there are certain uh, boxes you have to check and that, that pretty much dictates, I would say to a large extent, who you would select as uh, your independent board members. You're looking to build an independent audit committee. You need somebody who's who's a finance executive or has real domain expertise in that. And, and so those are required by um, SEC and you would of course comply with that. Um, at an earlier stage, I would say, you know, in my company is very early stage right now. Um, you have to really ask yourself, what do you want from that board? Um, and can you get that without having a formal board? What you really need at, at earlier stages in companies, people that will advise you and you could use as sounding board. And, and that could range from, I'm um, struggling to figure out how to build my company with everyone being remote. You know, how do I bring together uh, teams in a virtual environment uh, all the way to my international strategy? What should I think about? How should I think about my growth strategy? So I think there are very specific things as a founder um, you are going to need help with. You know, that's sort of what I use uh, you guys at M13 for and uh, Courtney Carter have been very gracious with their time. Um, and Matt, 
to yourself too. Like I reach out to you and say, hey, I'm thinking of recruiting and I'm just looking at this kind of a talent. What do you think? And whether you're on my board or not, I think that's the help kind of help you need, um, whether it's investors or independent board members. So I would say in earlier stages, a board member, uh, again, I'm, I'm combining investors as well as independent uh, board members in the earlier stages, is more, I think has much more of a role of um, being a sounding board and advisor rather than um, looking for governance. At a later stage, a board member has very specific fiduciary responsibilities to the invest, uh, to the stakeholders, um, right? Rather than even the management team, you're there to represent the, the shareholders. And so you're sort of like there to uh, make sure things are being done properly and, and the governance is in order. Whereas earlier stage, you're there really to be a sounding board as an advisor are to help the company grow, remove barriers for them, uh, help them bring in talent, help them with recruiting, making sure they're building the right culture. Because founders at earlier stages, I would say early to mid stage, have a lot on their plate. And they're just like constantly trying to, and there's, I think the big difference, by the way, uh, this is a topic for another time, you know, because I get asked a lot of time, um, what's the difference between being a senior executive in a large company and being in a found, being a founder, which is harder? What are the differences? Um, I, you know, I think the board member's role too, because uh, a startup is very different from a bigger company. Uh, board members need to understand founders typically don't have a lot of resources. So when you ask them questions, they have to do the work to get you the answers as well. Um, so I think being careful what questions are asked being a sounding board, I think those are the things I look for when I'm looking to put to put together a board at an earlier stage. In the later stage, the board members have a, I think first and foremost, the responsibility to understand the business, right? So you have to invest, you know, I'm on the board of Microsoft, very complex, very large company with so many things that they're in. I've spent my time uh, and show interest in learning the company. And what the management team, Microsoft executives in this case have to do is, take the time to educate me on certain aspects of the business and I have to take the time to learn that business. Um, so I would, I would say it's very, very different things. And um, you know, I, what I look for at this stage, uh, whether it's seed stage, I would say all the way to the level is who can help me, who will be good sounding boards, who has expertise in the business I'm trying to build, who has a network that can connect me to other people, who has the network to influence my recruiting strategy, those are the types that are uh, types of things that are more important to founders. That's great. Matt, how do you see a board kind of adding value following on that? And then how do you build out and recruit both independent and what are things you look for in building those boards? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Padma's right. A, at an early stage board and a, and a, you know, large public board do very different things and you need, you need different kinds of people on them for sure. Um, my, rule of thumb around early stage boards um, is what I call sort of the rule of ones. Um, and that is, I, I believe startups should have independent directors on their board from day one. Um, I think they do add a lot of value. Um, I think you have to pick them carefully, obviously, and you have to, um, you know, make sure that you're not tying yourself into them for four years or five years. Like what you need in year one and two of a startup might be very different than what you need in year three or four. There's nothing wrong with a one-year option grant or a two-year option grant. Um, so in my rule of ones, the first is independence from day one. Um, and then uh, the other ones that make up the rule are uh, that uh, I think startup boards should have one founder, one member of the management team on them and then one independent for every one investor. Um, so I've always um, run my boards that way and, and really believe that the balance of, um, of investor directors and independent directors is a very important balance to strike, um, as is only having one founder on the management team. And I, I've been really um, surprised in our work at Bolster where we're doing a ton of board searches for uh, private venture backed companies at, at all sizes and stages, the number of companies where the board is nothing but founders and VCs, even as they get into like series C and series D. Um, and the reality is it's just not healthy. Um, independent directors bring a very, very different uh, perspective to the business than either a professional investor, even if that investor had been an operator in a prior life. 
um, and certainly a different perspective from uh, management or from founders. Um, and uh, so I've been I've been trying to with with um, our client base to sort of evangelize this rule of ones. Um, I think independence from day one um, can make a ton of sense, and um, and balancing out um, investors as well. And you know you can have um, lots of different kinds of operators on your board um, as you add independent seats too. So um, you know to Padma's point, when you're larger and you're starting to think more about governance or going public, you'll need someone to chair an audit committee that checks a whole bunch of boxes that the SEC has out there for what constitutes an audit committee chair. But having someone who's a former CEO or a customer, um, or a former uh, or current executive at um, a larger company that you admire that's in your space or an adjacent space, whatever it is you're looking for, um, can really round out the discussion you have in a boardroom. So all those things that the board does at an early stage, um, you know, help uh, be a, a strategic sounding board, um, help you pattern match, you know, help you see the forest and the trees at the same time, help call you out on, on bullshit, quite frankly, right? Um, uh, those conversations go better when it's not just founders and VCs. That's great. And that's a great segue to the last question I think we'll have time for, which is really managing a relationship uh, with board members and founders. So Padma, I'll start with you. For the founders in the audience today, what's some of the best advice you could give for managing effective board relationships when you disagree on approach or even when you don't, just to really create healthy tension and healthy discussion? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, I think as Matt mentioned, you have to invest the time in building that relationship, right? Because board members are not someone you would see every day. It's a very different thing when you're building your, your leadership team, you're together most of the time and you're sort of like you're practicing together, you're training together, you're playing the game together. Uh, board members come in maybe once a quarter and so you have to invest the time to keep engaged and the board member needs to invest their time, uh, not just with the CEO, by the way. I think I would say board members have a responsibility to invest time to getting to know um, the CEO's leadership team and one level below. And so I think in, in a startup, choosing people who have a the time to work with you as a board member. If you pick somebody who's a big name and has you know, a lot of boards already, they may not have the time to invest in what you need. Like, you know, they need to be available um, to understand your business, to understand your, who your team is, get to know the team, point out to you, uh, you know, or, or debate with you who's a strong player on your team, who's not, you know, it's sort of like that, again, that outside in perspective, um, that's super important. So I think building that relationship is important. Um, yeah, there will be disagreements. You will have disagreements as a founder or as a CEO of a large public company with the board. Uh, and I think that's healthy. The board is there to challenge you and to offer a different perspective from, from where you're at. You know, I think if you are saying, these are my priorities, I can do A or B, which way should I go? The board member should have an opinion on A. And you may say, no, I think it should be B and there should be a, a debate about that. I think what I find and my advice, uh, both to board members as well as people choosing the board members is uh, pick someone, uh, pick someone who's interested in your business. You know, I think the board members, if you're going to be a board member, you have to realize a lot of your free time is going to be taken away by preparing for board meetings, reading up them. So don't take a board whose business you're not interested in, um, because it's sort of like, it's your time you're putting in. So you have to be excited about the business. So I think that's A for a board member. For people choosing the board member, I think looking at the person and making sure they have the right relevant experience and they have the time to invest um, to be an effective board member is key. Oftentimes, I find, you know, I purposely choose only two boards and then they're both pretty big boards and they take up a lot of my time um, because I know I can't afford to take any more time and be effective. And so that's super important. Uh, the second thing I would say is uh, what Matt pointed out, building that ways for people to connect informally outside of the meeting, because the meeting is usually fairly structured. You have an agenda, you go through those topics, uh, whether they're social, meeting each other for 
for a coffee or dinner or Zoom where things are delivered, where perhaps there's no agenda and you just say, hey, I want to give you an update and you sort of riff together and the board member is there to, to, to literally be that finding board, sounding board. That's important. Um, so making that as, as part of your regime, um, I think is just good hygiene. And the third thing is I, I find this very effective in both boards I'm in is sending for founders, sending write-ups to your board on a regular basis. I do, I do quarterly updates where it's more than just reporting the numbers, uh, giving them a quick update on how the culture is coming, where do you think the challenges are, you're seeing new competitors. I find written is a much more effective because you it actually helps you organize your thoughts. And that way you're not asking for real-time time commitment from the board member as well. So they can read and ask questions to you um, when they they have time. So I would do all three, you know, making sure you're educating the board member, taking some social time together, and then on the board member's part, investing the time to learn about the business and making sure you're picking boards whose businesses you truly are passionate about and are interested in. That's great. That's, that's such fantastic advice. I wish we had more time. The good news is that Matt has been gracious enough. Matt will be hosting a session uh, in early August for our founders to dig in more on this topic and both scaling your skeleton and scaling the business. So we'll get more opportunities to kind of hear from him. And I really encourage all the founders in our portfolio who are listening to please take some time to join us for that. We'll send out the comms shortly. Matt and Padma, thank you for this. This is incredibly interesting and edifying. And I really appreciate you both taking the time uh, to join us today. Thank you, Thanks Matt. Thanks for having us, Matt. Matt.